I've been wanting to do reviews lately, as what I currently do can't really be seen as reviews. I've made several half-hearted attempts, but really didn't like any of the results. If you look at my Dishonored review, you can see it was a sort of attempt to review a game, but didn't quite work out, you know, at least in my opinion. And I think the problem is that a game's worth can't really be quantified by a set of variables like graphics, sound, replayability, and so on, by themselves. You know, there are many sub-factors that go into what makes a game good. So I did a thought experiment. What are all the factors that go into making a game good? So I set about trying to figure out what kind of rating system would replace the old guard, you know, if that was even possible. If I was going to be doing reviews, I needed to know that what I was doing was new and unique, because how else would I gobble up all that sweet, delicious fraction of a penny I get per view? So the question is, what makes a game good, and can its value be measured? So let's dig in, shall we? To understand a current rating system, I wanted to look at the current model and see why it either does or does not work. For this I went to IGN, GameSpot, and Giant Bomb. All three outlets use a form of quantitative and qualitative variables to determine the value of a game. The issue with this is that the data they are using to score the game seems to be purely experiential and not based on any sort of hard data points. You know, GameSpot used to have a system wherein they laid out the various aesthetics of games like graphics, sound, etc., but they've seemed to have moved to a more straightforward number system and a list of good and bad traits listed next to the score. Now, I'm inclined to believe that this is because the gaming market has changed drastically over the years, and with things like graphics being the thing that people cared most about in the early Xbox and PlayStation generations, being less and less important to games made by indie devs, it became hard to score a game realistically. But this is purely speculation as I have no data to back this up. I mean, how do you score a game like Dead Cells against a game like Call of Duty in terms of graphics? Can you even do that with any kind of integrity? You see, you could make the argument that graphics are more about aesthetics and should be judged by the competence and cohesion of its style. And I would agree, but most people don't see it that way, so I believe this system was axed because of this confusion. It's the same thing with sound, you know, sound barely factors in now that most games are made for different setups, you know. PC and console are vastly different in the way that games are experienced orally. So now all three of these companies are using a scoring system, and even though Giant Bomb uses a 0 to 5 star rating system, it is still essentially a 1 out of 10 score. I mean, the format on all three sites is almost identical. They take a very clinical approach to their work, and the scoring system they use at times doesn't even make sense when compared to what is written. And as far as the pros and cons section of GameSpot's reviews, well, in most cases they leave something to be desired. I mean, see, GameSpot's writers are generally competent and at times great, but their reviews are a bit long at times, sometimes reaching well over into the three pages mark. For a company that is reaching for mass appeal, a numbering system is a great way for people who can't be bothered to read to see at a glance what the company thinks of a product. This is the first of many problems I will have with the scoring system here. The pros and cons section gives little snippets of notable things from the body of the manuscript above it. A sort of game review soundbite. So on their Absolver review, what a lazy reader will get out of this is, it's got really rewarding combat, deep customization, beautiful art design, and a mix of lighthearted and tense multiplayer. Now, depending on my biases, I can have a widely different reaction to seeing this list of pros. First off, it doesn't tell me what the combat is like. It just tells me that it's rewarding and in my feeble, lazy brain, what I think is rewarding combat means I'm going to get cool loot from the combat. But if you read the article, this shouldn't be your takeaway. The takeaway should be that the combat is challenging enough that you feel like you did something when you win. This information isn't communicated effectively in a soundbite, unfortunately. The cons list is just as bad at communicating information. Weapons feel overpowered in 1v1 duels. Multi-person brawls are messy. Hmm. If I haven't read the article, which I believe most have not, I don't really know what to make up of any of these statements. Again, these are fundamental parts of a video game which need deep introspection. What I wonder is, 
how, if at all, these cons and pros went into factor into the score that GameSpot gave it. So, off of their site, Next Machina got a 9 out of 10 and had one con. Absolver got an 8 out of 10 with two cons. Super Rude Bear Resurrection got a 9 out of 10 and had two cons. Well, damn it. There goes that theory, huh? So, what is GameSpot, Giant Bomb, and IGN basing their scores on now if they're not individually scoring each element of its design? Well, it seems that it's based on how good it felt to the reviewer, which is a bit strange. See, in research we base our findings off of what we can prove and what is observable. At least, we strive to do that. In an excellent documentary called Particle Fever, scientists from all over the world built the Large Hadron Collider over the span of 20 years in an attempt to find new particles, and among those was the Higgs boson. Peter Higgs was present the day that Atlas showed the results of their CERN laboratory test, but the whole success of the experiment was in question when they could not reach a sigma of 5, which is a p-value that research scientists use to determine the likelihood that a phenomenon they are experiencing is likely to be the elusive Higgs boson. It has a 1 in 3.5 million chance that it could be wrong, and they found it. But only through years of design, research, and stringent testing and rules was it made possible. That last part is important. Rules. You must have rules. But these rules must be based on something that is solid and logical about how a system or area of study works. For instance, you cannot base a game review off of how well it teaches you to cook mac and cheese. Games can be educational, but first and foremost, their function is, as defined by Webster's, an activity engaged in for the diversion or simple amusement. This definition does not exclude learning, but it states that its primary function is amusement or simple diversion. So knowing this, games should be judged purely on how fun they are, right? I mean, is it really that simple though? I mean, can you say a game like Silent Hill is fun while you're playing it? I mean, is it fun to be tense? Is it fun to be frightened? I mean, not at the moment, but maybe in retrospect, you might look back on it fondly for how the game made you feel. And if reviews are written as the content is experienced, these conflicting feelings could bias the way a reviewer feels about a game, and therefore, the resulting score might be inflated to compensate. You know, is it fun to grind for hours to get a shield you need to complete a set to do a specific raid in World of Warcraft? I mean, it depends on who you are, but if we're judging World of Warcraft as a product, you can't judge it based on what a minority of people will find enjoyment in, especially if you hope to judge it according to the scientific method. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there is an objective way to judge a game, but just because the quantitative data says a game is good doesn't mean it's fun to play, and if fun and diversion is the main goal of a game, shouldn't it be judged as such? So, subjectivity seems to be the way to judge a game, especially since the journalists currently in the industry seem to be moving ever closer in that direction. The question is, however, how do you judge something subjectively while rating it within the scientific method? Well, let's look at what seems to matter most to people in games. So, story is seen in a different way by different people, and depending on their experiences in life, they will feel differently about a game's given story. For instance, if a person has seen a lot of sci-fi movies, then a movie about a well-worn trope, it'll seem trite and will affect how they like the particular movie, book, or game. But what if you could measure something without bias? In order to measure anything, it is important to know what you are measuring and what result you hope to get in order to determine if the method of measurement is reliable. What determines the success of games are, I believe, three things. Well, actually, it's four things. What we see, what we hear, what we control, and how we control it. Each of these elements can be measured, but you need to determine what the sub-elements of each primary element are important to measure. So a question, can something as subjective as art be objectively measured? And can that measurement be done by one person? Technically, yes. But what are the technical pieces that go into making up a game's worth? Let's start with story. The elements of story, at least from my experience as a writer, are as follows. Characterization, 
plot, theme, and setting. Let's start with characterization. This is the method that the writer has used to write a character. So how do you measure how well a character is constructed? Isn't that subjective? It depends on the tool of measurement. If we follow rules of characterization, characters are defined by their needs, what they want essentially, and by what they will do to get what they want. The other element of characterization is what they believe, because what they believe in is more than likely to determine how they interact with others and the choices that they'll make. The third important feature of characterization in a story is how the character changes throughout the course of the story. So let's look at a character from fiction. Let's look at a very complex character from literature and one of my personal favorites, Guy Montag from Fahrenheit 451. Guy Montag is a fireman in a weird future where instead of putting out fires, they start them. The thing they burn? Books. The story has shown that knowledge is strictly forbidden and Guy is characterized in a way that makes him out to be just another guy who loves his job. In the words of Ray Bradbury, it was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. With the brass nozzle in his fist, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor, playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. Guy is characterized as a person who enjoys the job he does, as a person who knows that his primary function is to destroy history. This all changes when he meets a young girl whose playful demeanor and rebellious side seems to set Guy off on a dangerous track of thought that eventually brings down the very charcoal ruins of his own life. Ray Bradbury also managed to introduce us to the first significant event immediately after introducing us to Guy, which is the hallmark of any great piece of commercial fiction. Guy's need changes when the want to watch things burn changes to the need to read and discover as the playful child does. These are polar opposites of one another, the yin and yang that pulls at the heart of Guy's desires. He wants to discover the honey of words, and he is willing to lose everything to save one book, just one book, the last copy of its kind from the kerosene of the venomous python. So when measuring the worth of a character, we must take the change that a character takes and determine if both the needs of the character and the beliefs of that character are changed in some way to have a perfect structure of a character. So, if a character's change includes not only the, the change of their needs, but also a fundamental change in their beliefs, or their level of belief, then the character is that much deeper. If their need is uninteresting and their beliefs nuanced, this might result in a character who strengthens and therefore radicalizes their beliefs. Or if the need of a character is so strong, but their beliefs are weak, the result might be a character that aspires to greatness and only achieves it once their belief in their self is strong enough. You would score each of these variables based on how important the need is to the health and survival of that character. The need should be based on something that, if the character does not acquire this need, their lives will be all the more worse for it. The formula would look like this. Need plus consequences divided by two equals need score. These formulas are a work in progress and subject to change, of course. For belief, it would be belief plus intensity of belief divided by two equals the belief score. You would score these areas of characterization on a scale of one to 10. Then add these scores at a sum total of how much the change affects each of these areas of their lives. So the formula might look like this. Need plus belief plus change divided by three equals your character score. If you do this to all your characters, then add up the scores and divide them by character count, then you get your average one out of 10 characterization score. What I think that most reviewers do is they look at a character, they see their design, they hear their voice and how the character is voice acted and animated, and they determine the worth of that character based on just that. Now I remember seeing like in reviews that the plus side of Final Fantasy XII was its characters, especially Balthier, 
simply because he was such a good character that was well voice acted. But was Balthier a good character, objectively? I don't think that I can agree with reviewers as their opinions are colored by the bias of a very pleasing sounding voice. So how do you score a plot? Now I believe that if one were so inclined, they could apply this formula to every area of a game's story. For instance, with plot, one only needs to measure the beats of a story to determine if it moves at a good pace and doesn't contain arbitrary storytelling that exists simply to pad out the game time. For instance, if you know what the orientation of your story is, it is a simple act to make every quest in the game, every story mission, even every conversation apply itself to the theme and the plot. The formula of plot would look a bit more complicated. First, you would need to determine the phases of the story, which in Western storytelling and nearly all established cultures looks something like this. Exposition and first significant event. Conflict, complication, crisis, and then climax and resolve. This same structure should be followed when we talk about quest design. Even that of the ubiquitous side quest. To elaborate, a side quest is essentially the short story format of the video game world. In order for it to be gripping and effective, it should have all the elements of a short story which are typically exposition and first significant event, conflict, complication, resolve. While it is missing some pieces from the long form format, it still has all the necessary parts of a fully fleshed out story. Now you might be asking yourself, how this might apply to video games where the character development is entirely up to you. Well, that's a very simple matter. When you get to the first significant event, or even during the course of it, have you made enough decisions up to this point to know who you want your character to be? Has the world of the story been fleshed out well enough that you are on board for the roller coaster ride ahead? If so, then the game has managed to hit the first phase of this game with a plume and deserves a full score for it. Now, in order to accurately measure whether a story has appropriate pacing, one could turn to various resources on the subject, and some writers of screenplays actually have a formula which equates each phase down to a page count. I call this the pacing score. How long does this game take to introduce us to our characters? Now, this is typically the shortest phase because exposition is done throughout our story, but we need to know some very basic things about our character and the setting before moving on to the first significant event. Who are they? What do they look like? What do they need? And what do they believe? You could spend a ton of time in this phase if you're not careful. And you could spend far too little time and leave the viewer confused as to what the character is all about. If you linger here, the story drags. The first significant event is supposed to happen shortly after meeting the characters. And if this event is enough to spur the character into taking action, then this section is done right. If the first significant event is something that's too subtle, it can still work, but you run the risk of losing your player's interest. So this would drag the overall pacing score down a bit. Now, the other aspect of the first significant event is that it is supposed to happen and be an event that is so earth-shattering that the main character has no choice but to take action or risk the unfathomable. This could be as simple as paying the mortgage or stopping the destruction of a city. Scale is important, but more important than scale is how important the main problem of the story is to the lead character. If it is inconceivable that the character would not take action after this event, then the game has done its job and deserves its credit. Some stories have reluctant characters, and this is okay too. Sometimes a first significant event doesn't even push the character through the door, and in literature this is fine. Even some really great movies do it including the original Star Wars, but in a game, you run the risk of the story dragging along at a glacier's pace. Now, you take this approach to each story beat, picking it apart to find its failings, but in order to do this, you must have a working knowledge of what makes a story work. Now, this is a skill that many reviewers unfortunately do not have. You deduct .1 from the score for each problem you find. If you do this to each section of the story and get your score of 10 from the average based on a 2 point score for each story beat that is paced well, this should equal a score from 0 to 10. Now next is deviation. Now this is a weird measurement, okay, but this measurement is for how often the tone of each section of the story changes for reasons outside of the story. So for instance, 
A story that is essentially about how knowledge is more important than status cannot therefore contradict itself by having the lead character find out in the end that wealth is the key to happiness. It drags the resolve of the story down because the character doesn't change and therefore has his starting beliefs reinforced, therefore limiting the change that the character can go through. This deviation is also represented in tonal shifts from side quests. It is possible to do side quests that actually reinforce the orientation of the story, but as is the case most of the time with lesser games, side quests are just simply filler. Deviation is an important part of the pacing of a story. When you deviate from the main story, it has to be in order to reinforce the story's themes. If it isn't, then it's just filler and it adds nothing but playtime to the story. Witcher 3 does this extremely well, as it, it just goes all in towards reinforcing the theme that being there's no good choices, only varying intensities of gray. Two points in decimal to each section is rewarded when the tonal shift isn't present, and a point one deduction from each section when a tonal shift is present and doesn't fit the theme. So the formula would look a little bit like this. Pacing plus structure plus deviation divided by three equals plot score. The same formula can be applied to other aspects of the game, and as you can probably see in this research model, there can be no such thing as a perfect 10 out of 10 game because there would be far too many variables. I mean, but I firmly believe it is the closest thing I have seen to an accurate measurement of a game's value to a player. Now, there's yet another element that I am all but certain no review sites are taking into consideration, and that is player preference. See. The problem that I see is that review scores do not reflect the individual tastes of each player, and try as they might, game reviewers do not get that right. See, a reviewer has bias, now we all do. If a reviewer who is not a shooter fan is reviewing the newest Battlefield game for instance, he may try to inflate his scores to be more in line with what players want, or what FPS players typically would score a game of equal quality. But often the reviewer fails to capture this because of this negative bias and this results in the overinflation of review scores. The way to account for this is to, in essence, allow the player to decide how important each element that is being scored is to them. Instead of showing the reader of the review a flat score, for instance, ask them to take a quick survey. Ask them questions on a 1 to 5 scale of how each element is important to them when they create an account, right? And based on their answers, each element will then be adjusted on a percentage basis. For instance, if a player is not a fan of stories and games and tends to skip cutscenes, then the story may only affect the overall score by 20%, whereas an RPG heavy player may have the story rating affect the overall score by 100%. To understand this concept better, I have included an Excel document in the Dropbox link that has the formulas already plugged into it. There are two sheets. The first one is when you rate the game, and the other sheet is the one that you use as a player survey. This player survey is very basic, but it will adjust the scores based on the preferences of the player so that the score can better reflect what they like in a video game. After all, someone who prefers point-and-click adventures might not care too much about graphics. So if a game's graphics are outdated, or just plain messy, but the story is good, the player is much more likely to have a higher opinion of the game than a reviewer. Also, as a companion piece to this video, I will be releasing the full text of my theory at a later time in case any potential game reviewer would like to go over the system to see how it works or maybe tweak some things. I know this is a weird video for this channel, but it was put together in a fit of inspiration and I, I hope that all the dry number crunching didn't put anybody to sleep, I'm sure it did. I really want to start doing video reviews, but in an effort to be as fair and unbiased as possible, I really need to see what the potential pitfalls of grading a game's quality might be. Yeah, I believe I've done that, so expect some reviews soon, as well as some more video essays. And this has been a rant from Strategy, and now that you heard it, go play some games.